Hello there, and welcome to today's lecture in Sustainable Energy Studies. We're going to be talking about Earth's life support systems and how they work together in a way that creates the possibility for all life on Earth. We'll look at a surface level at some of these various systems, and then we'll understand how they fit together and most importantly, the role humans play in assisting or degrading these natural earth systems. So here we go with today's lecture, Earth's Life Support Systems. When we start to discuss earth and how it works, it can almost feel like a language. If you don't know how to speak a language, everything looks like this image here. You can tell that something's going on and that it has some kind of purpose, but you're unable to decipher what it means. And furthermore, you're unable to communicate in this language. So you can't, you can't tell what's going on and you, and you cannot really participate. And so environmental literacy is the idea that uh, we need to learn about the various components of the natural and human-made world in order to understand how they are interrelated or how they connect so that people can become responsible stewards of the earth. If you cannot read the language of the earth, how are you going to properly take care of it? How do you know when there's a problem? How do you know when things are going well? And how do you know what to do? Well, that's kind of the goal with sustainability is to develop environmental literacy and then go to work. Start implementing various things that will help to improve the way of life for people on the planet. So let's take a look at these various life support systems on earth. We call them systems because they have multiple components that are all interrelated. If you adjust one, it will adjust everything else. The four systems we're going to be talking about today are the various spheres. They're called spheres because the planet is a sphere and these are global systems. So the one we are most familiar with is atmosphere. That's relating to the air. We also have the hydrosphere. That's related to all water on the planet. We have the lithosphere, which is coming from the Greek root for stone. So that's the soil system and land systems. And then we have the biosphere, which is all of the living things and how they are interrelated. So not only are these four separate systems connected within themselves, but the systems themselves interact with each other. And you can imagine how complex everything becomes when we add all of these components together, try to understand how they change over time, and then consider how each of them influences each other. It becomes quite a complex type of a thing to understand. And we're only going to scratch the surface today. And instead of just defining all four in detail, I'm gonna focus on a few of the key environmental problems that are taking place within the Earth's life support system. And we'll start with climate change. And therefore, let's look at the atmosphere. Well, the atmosphere is the sky. It's the layer of gases that are held close to the Earth due to the Earth's gravity. And of course, it's what we breathe and it's where the birds fly. And there's all kinds of other valuable things that the atmosphere does, including protecting us from radiation from outer space, from meteorites that fall to the Earth, and also keeping the planet warm with the greenhouse effect. If we take a look at what is in the atmosphere, it's kind of interesting to understand 
the breakdown. Let's look at the pie chart on the top right. What is that is showing is the general percentages of various types of gas in the air, in the atmosphere. And the pink color is nitrogen. So 78% roughly of our atmosphere is nitrogen. That's the vast majority of it. Now, the next biggest piece is the purple color. That's O2, oxygen. And oxygen makes up just a little bit more than 20% of the air. Now, of course, we understand that oxygen is important because that's what is relevant for human life. But uh, if we add nitrogen and then oxygen, we've already got the vast majority of air and less than 1% remaining is everything else. So after nitrogen and oxygen, the next biggest gas is less than 1%, almost 1%, and that's argon. The remaining gases, everything else other than those three, makes up 0.04%. Let's take a look at that in greater detail at the lower pie chart. And you'll see the vast majority of that is CO2, carbon dioxide. But remember how small of a percentage of the total atmosphere that truly is. And then there's a few other trace amounts of other gases, including hydrogen, helium, and CH4. Now, CH4 is methane. That's another greenhouse gas that we hear about. So one thing to take in mind right now is just when we're talking about CO2 in the atmosphere, we're talking about a relatively small percentage of what is there in the total. The CO2 is very important in the atmosphere. It's how plants grow and it's what keeps us warm. But also, if we add a little bit more, it could have large-scale effects. Also of note is that air will contain a various amount of water vapor. This is clouds. This is humidity in the sky. Typically, it's about 1% at sea level. And if we took an average over the whole amount of the atmosphere, it's about 0.4% is water at any given time. And that also varies by temperature. As the sky gets warmer, as the earth gets warmer, the sky will hold more water and have lots of different effects. So let's take a look now at the hydrosphere and we learn about this usually in about second or third grade, the water cycle. We're considering how water moves on the planet. And we recognize that there's some key components to the water cycle. Mainly we have the oceans on Earth. And due to the heat of the sun, we get evaporation, mainly from the oceans, but we get evaporation from fresh water too. That evaporation is vapor, water vapor. It rises into the sky until it reaches cooler temperatures, which uh, will cause it to condense. The water condenses into clouds, and those clouds condense further until they become so heavy, having had all the water particles become condensed, that gravity will now pull them back to Earth. And this is where we get precipitation. Evaporation, condensation, precipitation. Those are the three primary elements of the water cycle. It's happening all the time, everywhere on Earth. And then, of course, all of the topography and complexity that can be found. So we have water coming in, water coming out in the form of evaporation, evapotranspiration, sublimation, which is just going straight from snow and ice to the sky. And then we have precipitation in the form of ice and snow and uh, rain, fog, dew. The water will infiltrate down into the soil where it will uh, be part of groundwater. It will 
run on the surface in streams. You'll have water going in between the ground and the surface seeping out in springs and e traveling through fresh water systems, being taken up by plants, sometimes being transpired back to the sky. But ultimately, that water is on a mission to make its way back to the ocean, and the cycle continues. We're not really creating or destroying water on this planet. It's relatively fixed, but it does change forms. And life on Earth depends on how this water change fo changes forms. So just like that water cycle, which we're very familiar with, we have a carbon cycle. Remember how, how small of a percentage CO2 is in the atmosphere. But we know that there's CO2 because that's what animals exhale and that's what plants need to grow. So in the presence of sunlight with atmospheric CO2, plants will take that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and lock it into the organism through the process of photosynthesis. And then when they uh, decay and die over time, they can go and become locked down in the soil and become what we know of as fossil fuel, coal, oil, natural gas, things like that. It also becomes the organic carbon in the soil. And of course, plant life becomes the vegetation that is the, the baseline of all food on the planet. All animals eat plants at some point. Either they eat the plants directly, like the cows do, or they eat them indirectly, like the lions who eat the grazing gazelles. Everyone ultimately relies on the energy coming from the sun. And the carbon follows the pathway of photosynthesis, be, then being consumed by animals, being deposited as waste products, and over time becoming locked up as fossil fuels down in the soil or under the oceans. And some of it over time gets released back into the atmosphere when there's a fire, when there's a volcano, or in general respiration of ecosystems. Now the human piece, that's kind of the relatively new piece that's where the commercial, industrial, automotive emissions, basically any kind of electricity or transportation or anything really modern is going to give off some kind of emissions. And that typically leads to carbon that was down in the soil as fossil fuels being burned and then released into the atmosphere. It's not that we're creating more carbon or anything like that. It's just that it's being moved from one phase to the other in a quick way that hopefully the rest of the earth can adapt to. But if we go too fast, there will be difficulties. So these are the systems that we're describing when we talk about the earth's life support systems. They take place in the atmosphere, but they're interrelated with the hydrosphere, the lithosphere down in the earth, and of course, the biosphere, the life. Let's continue to look at carbon in the atmosphere and really the role that it plays in keeping the planet warm enough for life to exist. This is called the greenhouse effect because the atmosphere will let sunlight in. And then as that sunlight hits the earth, it radiates back out into outer space in the form of heat infrared light. And that infrared light would just go right back out into space if it wasn't for the atmosphere. The atmosphere actually catches that infrared radiation radiating back out into space, and it causes it to vibrate. And as it vibrates, it generates heat. And so it acts like a blanket or like a glass window. Um, we call it the greenhouse effect because it's similar to a greenhouse where inside the air warms up because the sun can come through, but the heat gets trapped. Now, different gases will vibrate at different amounts. So some gases produce more heat than others. And CO2 is the primary 
greenhouse gas, meaning it vibrates good enough so that it wiggles back and forth longer than oxygen and nitrogen, and it does the primary role of keeping the planet warm enough for life to exist. Here's where you can start to see the problem. If we add extra CO2, we get extra vibration due to the infrared radiation, the heat, and then we get more heat, especially in our urban areas. Not only is the heat created from the greenhouse gases in the entire atmosphere, but down at human scale, we will see heat trapped closer to industrial and urban spaces as opposed to the more rural or countryside areas. This is known as the urban heat island effect. Because if we were just going to map the areas above 90 degrees, we would see kind of these islands of heat over the downtown urban commercial industrial areas on earth. And the rural suburban areas will remain relatively more cool. This is due to a number of factors. Many times, a lot of emissions are coming from the downtown areas, but more than anything, these are made of concrete and that material will heat up. It will store the heat. It will radiate the heat back. And they're lacking some of the natural cooling features like trees and streams and all of the things that are pleasant to be around on a hot day, you don't have them downtown. So we get these heat bubbles, these heat islands. Even the roads that are the color black will absorb more heat than if they were more lightly colored. And so there's lots of effects, both global and on a small kind of local scale that uh, we need to be paying attention to when it comes to the carbon cycle, the atmosphere, and everything else. So not only can we draw arrows to indicate where the carbon is going, but through some careful study and calculation, people have been able to figure out the CO2 equivalent and how much kind of actually counting, quantifying the carbon. And we can know the rate at which nature will pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and the rate at which CO2 will naturally go back into the atmosphere and where the carbon typically is stored. And so uh, in general, you can see the atmosphere stores uh, about 800. At this point, don't worry about the units, the gigatons of carbon per year. Just think about the atmosphere has 800, the soil has 2,300, and the deep ocean has 37,000. So it's almost orders of magnitude different. And some of that is naturally exchanging all the time. However, look at the red numbers. And the red numbers start with the fossil fuels, the cement, and the land use change. This is things that humans have done only in modern times. So basically, we're adding the equivalent of nine um, carbons back up into the atmosphere. And again, this is gigatons of carbon per year, but don't worry about that too much. So by adding that nine, some of it will be uh, leading to increased photosynthesis. You can see the plus three. Some of it will be taken up by the oceans. You can see plus two, but it's not enough to be taken up by the carbon cycle. And we end up with an annual carbon net increase of four relative to all these other numbers. Now, because we have that increase, that small amount that is being slowly transferred from the soil stores and the deep ocean stores in the form of burning fossil fuels, we're gonna see a rise in atmospheric carbon that will lead to all sorts of potential problems for humanity, along with other living things on the planet. And here's where the metaphor of a bathtub becomes useful when we analyze systems. 
And so we can think of any system like a bathtub. There's a source, there's a sink, and there's storage along the way. So in our case, let's consider the atmosphere to have a carbon bathtub. And there's a tap that fills the water of the tub. And that is the amount of CO2 equivalent going up into the atmosphere at any given time. There's also a drain. And that's the amount of CO2 equivalent coming out of the atmosphere at any given time, absorbed by plants and soils, absorbed by the ocean. So in order to keep the bathtub at uh, a safe level, you need to make sure that the water coming in is coming in less than or equal to the water going out. If you went into your bathroom all of a sudden and noticed that the bathtub was overflowing because the water was on and maybe the plug was not even there, but the water was still overflowing, there's only one thing you can do to stop that problem. You turn off the tap. You slow down the water coming in in order to allow for the drain to let some of the water go down. And this is a metaphor that uh, feels useful for people. We can understand this concept, and it's not that we need to stop all CO2 or that CO2 is bad or even really a pollution. It's not toxic to us. In fact, uh, it's important for all life on Earth. The real problem, though, is if the tap is on too strong. If there's too much CO2 going too quickly into the atmosphere, then the bathtub can overflow and we can lead to all sorts of issues, all sorts of problems. Some of these issues, we don't really even know what it could lead to, but we have a pretty good idea that it's not going to be something that we would enjoy. And so it's going to make life more difficult in almost every way. So this is really the heart of the concept of climate change and understanding the system dynamics behind it. Let's move on to ecology, which is the study of living things, how they relate to each other, and how they relate to the non-living part of Earth. So really, we're going to focus now on the biosphere, but we're going to be keeping in mind the system dynamics of climate change. And so ecology is really the study of the biosphere. We're studying the organisms themselves, how they relate to each other, to other organisms, and to the non-living or physical surroundings. There's several key components to an ecosystem. There's the non-living part. We call that the abiotic part. And then the living part can be broken down into three general categories of organisms, living things. They're the producers, the consumers, and the decomposers. And all of these components are interrelated just like we've seen with all of our other life support systems. So when we talk about that first element of living things, the producers, basically it's the plants. Anything that's green because it's conducting photosynthesis. So we've got algae in the ocean. We've got plants on land. We've got a few other interesting weird animals that might have some symbiotic relationship with algae or something but for the most part, it's the green things. And there's even a small group of organisms that live off of the energy of thermal vents down in the deep oceans or geothermal geysers. Little bacteria can live there. And it might be that that's the first life that ever evolved on Earth came from those thermal vents. Those are also producers, but by and large, the big group of producers on our earth, they're solar powered and they're using photosynthesis in order to take in energy from the sun and turn it into life. It's pretty miraculous how it works. And as horticulturists, we study it in greater detail than most people do, but it's something that is very important. And without 
the producers, then there's no consumers. Without the plants, there's no animals. And that's just a fact of life. So these are the primary producers of the ecosystem, the things that are conducting photosynthesis. And then once you have enough plants, then some of the living things might decide, hey, you know what? I don't have to make my own energy uh, or use photosynthesis. I can just go and steal that energy from the other producers. And that's where you get all the various types of consumers. These consumers end up uh, becoming arranged in kind of a hierarchy. It's not quite a food chain, more like a food web, but you end up with the things that directly eat the plants. And then you've got secondary consumers, the things that eat the primary consumers and so on as you go up what we would call the food chain. And within that, we have various uh, jobs or niches that have evolved over time. And the animals are basically either herbivores, they eat plants, omnivores, meaning they eat plants and animals, carnivores, meaning they only eat other animals, and then scavengers, which means they eat pretty much mostly dead animals. And that leads us to our final group of living things, the decomposers. And they're mainly the things living in the soil or in our atmosphere that cause li dead living things to decompose and return to mineral elements and energy that can then be utilized by future life. So primarily it's the fungi, the bacteria, and the invertebrates in the soil that are creating decomposition that are taking the energy stored in animal bodies, plant bodies, and returning them once they are no longer living, returning the energy, returning the minerals back to a form that can either be stored or used by future life. Decomposers are vital on this planet. Without them, we would just be uh, covered up with all the logs and bones of life before us, and there really would be no way for new life to ever come around. And now let's take a look at how these various organisms become organized into an ecosystem. So it all kind of starts with this uh, model of a pyramid, and at the smallest point of the pyramid is the individual. So you have one single living organism. In this case, we'll say it's Fluffy the rabbit. Now we can study that one individual and learn, okay, what's it going to do? Is it going to go right? Is it going to go left? And that is its own kind of interesting study of life. But then we'll take a bunch of uh, rabbits, fluffy with all her friends. They're all rabbits. That is what we call a population. So all members of the same type of organism living in an ecosystem is a population. But now those rabbits, they're not living on some deserted island of just rabbits alone. They live in a community. And so you've got Fluffy with fox, porcupine, squirrel, deer, and wolf populations. And a group of living things of different species found in an ecosystem is called a community. And so we have multiple populations in one community. And then... Just like with human communities, we know that there's a boundary around them. And eventually, if you go far enough away, you make it to another community. And sometimes in one city, you can have various communities in the same place based on who you are and who you interact with. And so multiple communities makes up an ecosystem. And we define that as all things, living and non-living, that live around Fluffy the rabbit. And so it's all the elements and their interaction of a given area is an ecosystem. But what if we have multiple ecosystems as we know we do? Well, then you put them together, a large group of similar ecosystems makes up a biome. And that's what ends up becoming the habitat for Fluffy. Fluffy will live in various ecosystems 
and all usually in one similar area, one similar type that we call a biome. And then, of course, there's the Earth, planet Earth, makes up the biosphere, which is all of the biomes put together, as well as how they interrelate. So there's all kinds of complex interactions. And if you wanted to study any of this, you would probably end up choosing one area in particular to specialize. But ultimately, all these things are at any given time interacting. And remember, we're really still looking at one species, but then everything interacts with itself. So very complex to me, very interesting. Now, if we want to look at these biomes and try to understand them a little bit better, where do they tend to end up? Well, this is where biology and geography become interrelated. And it's based on climate. Basically, the, the temperature and the moisture of an area determines where, determines what kind of biome you get in what area. So if we go all the way to the lowest dryness and the hottest temperature, you see we follow those two arrows and we get to the desert. This is a tropical region of desert, kind of like the Sahara Desert in Africa, right on the equator. But if you stay in the tropical region and you decrease the dryness or you increase the rainfall at high temperature, you end up with tropical forest. Now, if we stay on the humid side, the left side of the pyramid, and decrease the temperature, go down in temperature, we end up with a temperate forest or a boreal forest, and ultimately, it gets so cold that you only end up with tundra, depend, independent of its moisture. And everywhere in between, we have grasslands and chaparral and all the various types of biomes, different types of ecosystems that uh, basically are determined because of these climate or geographical features. And then, of course, we add the dimension of time and we can recognize that things are never the same all the time. They're actually always in progress, sometimes going forwards, sometimes going backwards. And really, everything's just progressing in one way or another. So we call this ecological succession. This is the study of when are we in time? What does the ecosystem look like today? And what will it look like in the future? if it is undisturbed, or even if it is disturbed. And usually, if you do not disturb an ecosystem, a terrestrial ecosystem, you'll end up with starting out with weeds and those plants that are easy to colonize an area that nothing else grows. Eventually, they give way to some of the more diverse perennial types of plants, still kind of low growing grassy looking things, which eventually creates enough topsoil and good microclimate for small shrubs to develop. Those small shrubs grow taller than the grasses. They create shade under which uh, birds can come in and deposit seeds of the small trees. The small trees get established and they can end up then growing taller and shading out the other species. And eventually the trees even advance from pine type forests, eventually leading toward like a hardwood type forest, a deciduous or a broadleaf forest, depending on the area. And sometimes you kind of stop. Uh, in the mountains, we usually stop at pines. And in the valleys, we usually stop at oaks. So various conditions, but recognizing that time plays an element in the change of living things on Earth. This is a natural process, but it can also be manipulated by humans. So every living thing is interacting with other living things, and it's at a certain point in time. And what is it doing? Well, we call that the niche. What is the niche of the organism? And you can think of it like a job. 
what is the job that it's doing? And it's not doing it because it's kind. It's doing it because it's getting paid. And it usually gets paid in the form of food. Um, or it could be paid in other ways that generally help it to survive and reproduce. So the ecological niche describes how any organism or population responds to the distribution of resources and competitors and how it in turn alters those same factors. We've got some images here. One is showing a pine seedling, and then we're learning that the pine seedling will develop a symbiotic relationship with fungus. So the image on the left is the pine seedling alone. The image on the right is the pine seedling once it has uh, hooked up with the fungus in the soil. And you can see that in this case, it's gonna be beneficial for both organisms. Beneficial for the fungus because the, the plant will release some sugar from photosynthesis down into the soil and feed the fungus. In turn, the fungus will extend the root system of the plant and enable broader area with which to gather water and minerals from the soil. So they help each other out. It's the same with the hummingbird and the sage. The Any flower that's red tubular flower is typically the perfect attractor for a hummingbird. And when you take a look at the hummingbird's feathers, in particular on the face, there are some specialized feathers that are perfect for collecting the pollen. Now, the hummingbird doesn't care about the pollen. All it cares about is drinking the nectar, which is a form of food for the hummingbird. And in turn, the flower gets the service of pollination. And you may ask yourself, well, who came up with that? Which one came first? The the pollinator or the pollen? And uh, well, we know there's some wind pollination out there, but how did it all get started? That's part of this fantastic discovery of living th things on the planet. We have mechanisms to describe how that could have taken place through evolution and how mutualisms tend to uh, form over time. But uh, it's happened on such a scale that it's hard for humans to really understand it. And so we tend to just, uh, when we really learn these things, step back in amazement and say, this had to have been the plan all along. And uh, whether it was someone's plan or not, uh, what is here today is the result of what was here yesterday. And so this has been unfolding for a very long time. And we are inheriting a system, a biosphere that is very well developed well-developed enough for humans to come along and exist comfortably. Now, it's not only happy relationships that exist between organisms. There is, of course, competition. There's predation. There's parasites. There's all kinds of things where living things kill and eat other living things. And there's various uh, aspects to those relationships. Now, over time, the organism changes, the population, the number of those organisms will change based on the openings of the niche. How many job opportunities are there? Well, that's going to dictate how many workers you have. And when the company grows, then you can hire more people. When the company shrinks or the economy gets hard, then you have to lay people off. It's the same with populations and organisms. If the resources become abundantly available, well, then the population will grow at an exponential rate, like the graph on the left-hand side. Over time, a population will grow at a curve that's like an exponential growth. And eventually, though, you'll run out of resources, with either space or food or any other kind of thing that's going to limit the growth of your population. And that limit is called the carrying capacity, as you can see on the right-hand side. So it may start out as exponential growth, but it ends up as logistic or logarithmic growth. And you end up with a classic S curve, meaning you will grow quickly until you start to reach a limit, and then your population growth will slow. 
and eventually stabilize at a carrying capacity. And so the carrying capacity of any ecosystem is the maximum population size that the environment can sustain indefinitely, given the food, habitat, water, and other available necessities. All living things have a carrying capacity because all living things live in populations. Now, this carrying capacity is never a straight line. It will never just be a perfect zero growth flat line at that carrying capacity. There's always going to be some movement growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking. And we call that a dynamic equilibrium. What it means is there's a balance, there's equilibrium in your population. However, it's going to be kind of going on either side of the line, back and forth. And that's just the general sustainable rate. You end up with a dynamic equilibrium, and that is natural. That's actually the way populations work over time. The image on the left-hand side is kind of showing a conceptual graph of the dynamic equilibrium. And the chart on the right-hand side is showing kind of a little more complex theoretical aspect of this dynamic equilibrium. It's recognizing that populations go through kind of four different phases over time. And ignore the terms because they're kind of uh, esoteric. They're hard to really understand, but it's talking about populations of living things go through a growth phase. That growth takes them into kind of a conservation of energy phase. And then it gets released due to some disruptive event. Once it's all released, it gets reorganized and then it grows again. So you could imagine a forest, it starts to grow. You get kind of the very mature old growth forest. And then there's a fire. The fire is where the redwoods start on the chart. And that fire breaks everything down and allows those minerals to become reorganized and then new growth happens after the fire. So that's really kind of what is taking place when this dynamic equilibrium is happening. It's a natural process, and we can't really freeze that in time. We can't stop that from happening, but we can learn to work with the natural forces. Now, it's not enough to look at any one organism on their own, of course. We recognize that there are these relationships between organisms Sometimes it's competitive, sometimes it's cooperative. But in the case of like a competitive relationship, it's the classic predator-prey cycle where you may have, in this case, lots of rabbits growing in an area. If you've got a lot of rabbits, once the population takes off, then that's going to be a great place for the lynx or for the fox to come in and eat some of those rabbits. So usually right after the prey population rises, you'll see an increase in the predator population. And then eventually the foxes will grow to a point where they kind of start to eat all the rabbits and then the rabbit population will go down. And then it reaches a point where at some point the rabbit population goes down so far that now there's not enough rabbits for all the foxes that are around. So the fox population has to shrink. Either the foxes move to some other place or they die off because there's uh, not enough food. And then the fox population shrinks to a point that it relieves the pressure on the rabbits and then the rabbit population goes back up again. So here's an example of that dynamic equilibrium of a carrying capacity of a ecosystem because of two organisms and how they relate to each other. And of course, there's more than two. So imagine, okay, it's that complex with two. What if I add all the others plus the abiotic? Oh man, it's almost more than we can ever study. It ends up in a form of chaos, which means we can't really measure or predict what it will become in the future. Now, there is the possibility that a population can go above the carrying capacity for a short time. Um, however, the more you go past the carrying capacity, 
say you can have 10 rabbits on a field, but if you put 20 rabbits on that field, the rabbits would be okay for a while, but then eventually they're going to eat all the grass very quickly. And they say the field would only support 10 rabbits. You're going to end up with uh, eating all the grass faster than the grass can grow. And now your 20 rabbits are going to crash. The population will overshoot the carrying capacity and it will crash. And this is part of how you maintain that dynamic equilibrium. But the concept here is that the higher above the carrying capacity you go, the worse the crash will be on the other side. And it's possible to overshoot the carrying capacity so much that you lead to a collapse of the population, where instead of just simply rebounding, you've caused damage that takes long enough to repair, it's going to be a massive die-off and decline in the population density. And sometimes it may never come back to the way it was if things have changed since the time that it was made. So there is a risk of overshoot and collapse of the carrying capacity when population uh, and resource consumption outstrips the ability for the natural system to replenish. So now let's finally take a look at humans. Human population growth has been following that same logistic curve where it starts out as exponential growth and then eventually will taper off in its growth rate toward a carrying capacity. And we see two different uh, lines here. The blue is the world population. And this is world population in 2015 in the dark blue. The projection is to 2100. And it is saying we're going to make it up to 11.2 billion people. And currently we're, we're over 7.4 billion. I think we're closer to eight. Um, but notice how at some point that curve took off. When did it take off? Right in the 1960s is when the growth rate was kind of at its peak and really started, uh, if you look at the red line, started to spike in the 1920s. This is because of rapid industrialization that made food widely available, cheap and easy. Uh, we could get fertilizer out of the sky. The nitrogen from the air can be turned and synthesized into uh, fertilizer, enabling people to grow lots of food for very cheap. And that took place all over the world. And so global population was able to take off due to the rapid development of science and technology. And you can see that the red line, the growth rate, is less than 1% each year, starting in 1750. For over 200 years, it's less than 1%. And right when we start releasing all the cheap and easy food, then the human population starts to jump and grow up to a 2% growth rate. That was the fastest we were growing. And then we started to slow down in our growth. The red line starts to go down over time. Now notice the population will still climb even though the growth rate is slowing, but uh, the projections are that the growth rate will slow to well below what it was previously. And this is where the human population reaches the carrying capacity on Earth and becomes stable. Now, of course, if some technology changes, if we go to Mars and make a, a second planet, uh, if there's some kind of rapidly available cheap and easy resource, then we can change the carrying capacity. But if we don't change the carrying capacity, our growth rate is going to end up at a relatively stable dynamic equilibrium. So two things here to think about. One is that we're heading toward a zero growth population, a population that's going to be barely replacing itself. So we need to have a way of life that supports that. Also, uh, 
Remember, overshoot and collapse. We need to be very careful in this moment that uh, we don't overshoot the population and lead to a collapse. Now, there's some speculation that uh, we're not at risk of that because the birth rate has dropped so low that uh, it's not going to be at replacement levels and, and our maximum population may not end up going up to 11 billion. It may end up staying much less because people are having less children. But uh, a lot of it's projection. We don't really know, but we do know we've got options on how it proceeds. And if humanity overshoots the carrying capacity, that's one significant issue. The other issue is the more people, the more consumption, the more waste, the more pollution. So we want to keep all of these things in mind so we can act responsibly on Earth. This is where the ecological footprint concept comes back into play. And you can think about the average human on Earth and the resources they consume. And if everybody on the planet consumed at that rate, would it be enough? Would it be within the carrying capacity of the Earth? And for almost everybody in the United States or in most developed countries, modern developed technological countries, you're living above the carrying capacity of the earth. There's really no way to avoid that. And uh, it's only a matter of time then until either the lifestyle changes or the population decreases in order to allow the future to continue living at a modern way of life. Now we've got these three dilemmas and there's more than three. We learned that there's the nine planetary boundaries, but take a look at the charts. The three dilemmas that happen to be kind of taking place at the same time in history, which is what makes this challenge so difficult. And there are some other ones that to, in today's uh, modern times, we could say are adding to the complications. But one is a concept that used to be referred to as peak oil. Peak oil was really popular a little over 10 years ago when uh, engineers, scientists kind of were predicting that we were reaching the end of cheap and freely available oil on Earth. And without a replacement fuel, then humanity's population would collapse. It has turned out that uh, technology came around that enabled new types of oil to be extracted at a, at a more economically feasible price. In particular, fracking, hydraulic fracturing, has prolonged the availability of fossil fuel. So even though people are not really worried about peak oil today, it does not change the fact that no new oil is being made on a human time scale. So it's going to run out. And when it does, we've got our issues. And as we get closer to consuming it, the oil that remains is going to be more and more expensive to use. It's going to take more energy to get. It's going to take more energy to refine. And eventually, it's going to take more energy than it gives. And so at some point, it'll make more sense to just Stop getting it out of the ground and use up what we've got because it'll take two barrels of oil to drill down, find, and clean one barrel of oil. Eventually, it's going away. That's the definition of a fossil fuel. So we need to think about that. And notice the chart has that kind of logarithmic curve. That's the chart on the left. The next one we notice is population. Human population has kind of followed this world oil production. And so if we know we're nearing peak oil, we can expect human population to be intricately linked. And we have a similar kind of the hockey stick chart. At this point, it's exponential growth. I think it's more than exponential growth. We haven't yet seen too much of the tapering off, but we're getting there. And so there's a big uncertainty ahead. And finally, we look at climate change, and in particular, the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide being the primary one, but there's others, including methane. And notice how in the history, human history, going back to the year zero, they were relatively flat in our atmosphere. And all of a sudden, with industrialization, with the burning of fossil fuels, 
And with the rapid growth of population, we've had a massive spike of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. All three of these are very intricately linked. And if we continue to burn fossil fuels to the point where we run out, if we continue to add greenhouse gases to the point where we have issues, well, we can expect human population to follow suit. And we know that the more we overshoot, the more we collapse. And we want to avoid that as much as possible for future population of people on the planet. Which brings us to the final concept of the day, this idea of the triple bottom line. We recognize that our problems are complex, multiple, and interrelated. And therefore, our solutions must similarly be multiple and interrelated. And it's not enough to just say, we got to do what's good for the planet, because we're in a world today, a modern human system, an economy that is based on certain values, certain things. Most companies, they call it the bottom line, and it's the dollars and cents. So if it makes money, I'm going to do it. That's just how the world works. We're all going to try to make money because we use the money to live. And that's what helps us grow and have all the necessities and comforts of life is money. However, if we only think about money, we're going to only be thinking about the short term. And we need to be considering the bigger picture. We need to be considering the environment. The environment is what, where everything takes place. So if we make money at the expense of the environment, then in the, eventually we're going to limit our ability to make money in the future. And it's the same with social aspects. If we destroy people, if we destroy populations or cultures at the expense of money, we're going to be hurting the future ability of all of us to thrive and succeed. And so sustainability has adopted what's called a triple bottom line, where we need to make our decisions that are in line with what is good for the economy. Because if it's not in today's world, it's not very realistic. But also, we need to be thinking about the social cost and the environmental cost of various things that we choose to do in the world. And so this can be sometimes abbreviated as the three P's, people, planet, profit. So if it's going to be a sustainable solution, you got to think about the three P's, people, planet, prop, profit. And if you like a different letter, you could say the three E's, the environment, the economy, and equity. Equity is just fairness for all people. And so we're following that triple bottom line concept when we think about sustainability and we think about what kind of goals we can set, what kind of plans we can make, and ultimately what kind of steps, actions it will take to keep the good parts of our way of life going. So there we go with kind of a in-depth review of the Earth's life support systems with a focus on the climate, in particular climate change and how that takes place and the dynamics involved and how those will impact the biosphere, the living things on the planet, including humanity, how humanity is intricately linked now to the amount of greenhouse gases and ultimately to the possibility of maintaining a comfortable life into the future. Certainly some changes need to be made, but there's maybe things we want to keep with our modern world. And the question for sustainability is how do we keep all the good stuff? How do we stop with some of the more harmful things? And how do we do it in a way that's going to cause the least harm and maybe lead toward the greatest outcome? We start off this class talking about some of the environmental problems and the challenges, but basically from here on out, we're going to be focused on solutions keeping in mind the monumental evidence we have, the need to act yesterday, the need to act today, we're gonna to be focused on what can we do? What is currently being done and where can we go to enhance 
those efforts so that we have a sustainable future. Sustainability is not an option by definition. If we're not sustainable, what does that mean? It means we won't, we won't keep going. So if you want to keep going, then sustainability by definition is the only way. And so in this class, we're going to be focusing on those very concepts. It has been my pleasure presenting this information to you, and it's only the beginning of our course. And as always, feel free to uh, reach out in our class discussions, or you can ask me questions directly. And I'm happy to continue the conversation as we begin our discussion of sustainable energy studies.